Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcia Nedland, and we are just broadcasting now, so we're allowing all the participants to enter the webinar. So we'll be, we'll hold for a second while that happens, and then we'll start up again in a minute, and we are being recorded right now. This webinar will be recorded and posted on our website, middleneighborhoods.org. And we'll send a follow-up email to everyone that registered for this webinar so that you have the link. Oh, there's Darlene Russell. Hi, Darlene. Hi, Justin. In case not everyone was able to hear me before, we're just waiting for um, the participants to enter the webinar. We have an extraordinary number of people who actually register for this webinar, so it's going to take a while to um, have everyone move into the space. I'm really enjoying watching everyone's chats, introducing themselves. Spartanburg. And hi, Jennifer. I haven't talked to you in quite a long time. Ken from Detroit. Stephanie in Milwaukee. Old home week on the web. It sure is. And Rachel Meadows in Philly, speaking of the rain, I guess for all of you East Coasters, there's a hurricane moving right up the coast. Um, we know that Alan Malik, one of our panelists, um, is in that hurricane fallout right now. He warned us that he might lose power. <laughs> I, did. I did. Yeah, I did this morning already once. Yeah. Syracuse, Greensboro. Oh, I'm so excited to see everyone from across the country. There's Latasha, who I spoke to this morning. The magic of Zoom. Yeah, that was Nidra, Sim Spears, our other panelist today. There's some Chicago folks. Ooh. <laughs> Nidra is from Chicago. Alan is in uh, well, where in New Jersey? It's a little village called Roosevelt. It's really rural, rural central New Jersey. That's right. I, my, I'm Marcia Nedlin. I'm in Tucson, Arizona right now. And then our helper in all things, Ann DePetta, is in Ithaca, New York. So Memphis. Cleveland. Cambridge. <gasps> wow. Selma. Yeah, Selma, excellent. Um, so for everyone who is on already, we had more than 600 people register for this 
webinar today, which as you might imagine is a few more than we normally get. Um, and so I think that that means it just takes, you know, it takes longer for the system to admit everyone. We're really excited about the response to this topic. Hey, Marsha, while we're waiting for people to drop in, do you want to just um, test to make sure you have oh, uh, yes, see if I can control of my, it. yeah. Well, it's lagging again, so let's see. Sometimes you just have to click something to make it you know. recognize <laughs> that you're there. Wake up. There you go. Oh. Yes, your cameras are off. Someone asked that question. Birmingham, could you all please put your website? Francie Ferguson. Yes. Oh, I get it. Hi, Francie. If I, if I respond to a chat, I guess that messes up your, that takes over your. Um... Yeah, we're, we're still experimenting with the sharing control of a PowerPoint back and forth, everybody. Jacksonville, Florida. Raquel raised her hand. I guess Anne's going to deal with them. Well, my only problem is with our screen sharing. If I touch anything, oh. it takes over. <laughs> Okay, let me let me see some. And then Don raised her hand as well. Yeah. Uh, I unmuted you, Don. Is that what you were hoping for, or were you just raise, uh, waving? Oh, she's still muted. He said it was a mistake. Sorry. Okay. All right. <laughs> It is Old Home Week. Hi, Presley Gillespie. There's a question if the webinar will be available later from Amira, and yes. Um, it sure will. In fact, we'll probably uh, just do a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this and give you the link, although it will be posted at middleneighborhoods.org. Okay, I think I'm going to get started just so that we can, you know, stay roughly um, within the time frame that we set out for this, even though we only have about 300 of our 600 and some participants so far, and I think they'll continue to be entering. So um, good morning. I'm Marcia Nedland. I am the contracted organizer for the Middle Neighborhoods Community of Practice, which I'll explain in a moment. And I also have a consulting practice, Fall Creek Consultants, and uh, I do uh, a fair amount of work in middle neighborhoods myself through that consulting practice. So it takes, we're having a little trouble with slide advancement. So we'll, I have to wake it up here every now and then. This, I will say, is Black Middle Neighborhoods and Legacy Cities Part One, the challenges and opportunities. And we are um, also going to be doing part two on August 25th, which will move into strategies. So 
advance, Marsha. I can do it. Yeah. Oh, there you go. You oh, there, it. Okay. It'll probably take a right. minute. Yeah. <laughs> so um, just a little background before I turn it over to our panelists. Um, the Middle Neighborhoods um, Movement is a national initiative that's focused on mobilizing attention on middle neighborhoods and the um, trends of decline that they're facing. Um, and we're advocating for people to not only notice that, but to research it, um, think about policies related to it, um, and to connect people who are, are practitioners in that area. The initiative is coordinated by the National Community Stabilization Trust, that's our home, and we're, uh, the movement is advised by a steering committee of 20 prominent researchers, practitioners, and policymakers. Um, one component of the initiative is the community of practice. And um, hi, Ellie. <laughs> and uh, so the community of practice is an informal but facilitated network of over 300 practitioners um, and researchers and policymakers who are engaged in revitalizing middle neighborhoods. Uh, COP members share learnings through topical webinars such as this one. Um, we also do referrals between members. Um, we are hoping when the virus ends or is under better control to facilitate site visits between members. We do a lot of um, phone calls and impromptu, you know, um, virtual meetings and occasional larger group events. The community of practice is supported by NeighborWorks America as a partner to NCST and is staffed by a small team of organizers, including myself and Anne, who's also on the call with us today. So because we were not able to pull off Middle Neighborhoods 101 right before this, which we usually offer that webinar um, every time we do a topical webinar like this, I thought I'd just hit a couple of our introductory slides that explain what Middle Neighborhoods in general are, and then we'll move into um, talking about uh, black middle neighborhoods and the special challenges and opportunities that they face. So characteristics of middle neighborhoods, they are mostly uh, single family housing. They were mostly built for families with children, which explains part of why um, they are vulnerable to decline right now, since that's a declining demographic in this country. They tend in, in terms of our membership to still have more than 50% owner occupancy, but if you watch and examine what the trends have been, that has often slowly eroding. The housing stock is aging, but it's generally um, in acceptable condition. The challenge we most often face is that it lacks some features and updates that would allow it to compete well for today's home buyers. Chief among that, my pet peeve, the one bathroom home, which we find in many markets um, attracts more absentee investor purchasers than owner occupants. Property values in middle neighborhoods range, you know, the trends range from a slow decline. Some places it's just flat. Um, some places it might be increasing slightly, but it's still underperforming against the city overall or against inflation. Most of our members so far don't see hyperinflation of housing price as a risk in their middle neighborhoods. Um, we have a few exceptions to that, and I suspect it's partly just a, a function of the fact that our earliest membership came from legacy cities in the Northeast, and as we continue to grow the COP, we're starting to move into more Sun Belt and Western cities where um, the markets are just stronger generally, and so gentrification may actually be an issue. Um, and we find that middle neighborhoods are more racially and ethnically diverse than the you know, higher income or lower income neighborhoods. And very importantly, it, they're a place where there was very hard won middle household wealth um, that we're trying to, to protect. So one of the, a set of common threads about middle neighborhoods in general is just that they're faltering in their sustainability. And by that we mean things like their ability to reliably attract replacement owner occupants um, when someone decides to move um, or an older resident decides to move in with their kids or a nursing home. You know, the question is always, if someone moves out of this property, what's going to happen to it? And in healthier times, middle neighborhoods were able to, you know, you could pretty much count that they were going to reliably attract another owner occupant buyer. 
and they are losing their ability to do that. They're also um, faltering in their ability to generate home values that support quality maintenance, repairs, and updates without having an appraisal gap. Um, faltering in their ability to repel irresponsible investors. Um, used to be their investors would be pretty high quality. And now as prices erode, values erode, um, they're starting to become attractive to investors that actually compromise the quality of life there. Um, faltering in their ability to maintain engaged residents who take stewardship of the neighborhood. You know, that's um, in part a function of the extent to which owner occupancy erodes and you have a higher transition rate of residents. But it's one of the factors that is most important to a healthy neighborhood we know. Um, and finally, they're faltering in their ability to deliver home equity growth to the owners that we're hoping to, you know, have that as the foundation of their own personal financial stability and also revenue to municipal government, um, which ha is an issue that's starting to inspire um, several cities to think about investing in middle neighborhoods with um, funds like general revenue sharing, um, bond proceeds, and even um, sales tax funds. In other words, not federally appropriated um, funds. Okay, so what are we doing today? Uh, I'm going to do a, a few introductions, then we're going to move to Alan Malik, who's going to present his research um, on this topic of Black middle neighborhoods and legacy cities. And then we'll switch to Nidra Sim Spears, who will talk about the practice, what it's like to actually be working in a set of Black middle neighborhoods and to try to design strategies that respond to the unique challenges that they face. We'll do a little Q&A um, at the end, and then we'll do a closing. Um, our goal overall for today is not to go into strategy, but rather to conclude with everyone leaving this webinar, having a clear understanding of the unique um, trends, impacts that have shaped Black middle neighborhoods and the unique challenges that they face, which are a set of challenges that we um, propose to you really need to be considered and addressed when crafting successful strategies to stabilize black middle neighborhoods and to help them succeed. Um, so our presenters today are Alan Malik, who's a senior fellow at the Center for Community Progress. Um, I always like to give Alan uh, props for his, his actual practitioner chops. He did used to uh, run, oh, he'll have to remind me the name of his department, but it was community development-ish, um, that department for the city of Trenton, New Jersey. So he has been out there in the field. Um, and Alan, um, many people will be familiar with for a variety of research he's done, but he has focused on research for the Middle Neighborhoods Initiative in the last year on Black Middle Neighborhoods, because we really want to understand what's different about them. And we know that they face you know, it's, it's slower and more challenging to stabilize them than other middle neighborhoods. Nidra Sim Spears is the executive director of the Greater Chatham Initiative, which um, is a nonprofit that works with four black middle neighborhoods in the south side of Chicago. She is also um, a member of our Middle Neighborhoods National Steering Committee, and she's the co-chair of our community of practice. Um, and if you go ever and read her bio at her website, it's, um, it's pretty impressive. So um, now I'd like to let um, Ann hand over controls to Alan and he'll start walking us through the research. Hey, it's oh. like it works, there we there go. go. <laughs> okay, well first welcome and thank you all for being here. I see we're up to about 350 participants, which is great. And I'm going to talk about the challenges and so I'm going to start with some of the history because I think it's really important to understand the history and the background and the dynamics of the black middle neighborhood because this is a very important and a very distinctive type of neighborhood. And most, most black middle neighborhoods 
actually emerged during the 1960s and 1970s. And this was an amazing era in many respects for the cities. On the one hand, there was a lot of economic decline, but on the other hand, there was an explosion. Now, somebody just took the screen away from, the control away from me. There we go, no. Okay, there was an explosion of black home ownership. And as you can see in the table, black home ownership more than doubled from 1960 to 1980. And it's not, nothing like that has happened since. And a lot of things, and a lot of that had to do with the creation of black middle neighborhoods. And a whole bunch of things were happening. I mean, up to that point, the great majority of black residents of our cities were essentially forced to live in highly segregated areas like you know, Bronzeville in Chicago, Black Bottom in Detroit, etc. Now, in many respects, these areas had a lot of vitality and a lot of energy, but they were also had very overcrowded and often physically substandard housing conditions. They also were almost entirely absentee owned and offered very few people a real opportunity for home ownership. So as white families left the cities, which they did in the millions during the 60s and 70s, that created an amazing opportunity for African-American families to become homeowners in neighborhoods that had a higher quality housing than the neighborhoods they'd been into up to that point. And if you look, for example, this is a, a, a fairly typical scene from the area known as Black Bottom in Detroit, which by the way, was named that long before it became an African-American neighborhood having to do with the dark alluvial soils in the areas. And another scene from a neighborhood known as McCrary St. Mary's, which became an African-American middle neighborhood starting in the 1970s. And if you look, this is, you can see how in, in 1940, the black population of the Detroit was concentrated in a very small part of the city. By 1970, it had spread to where it was now in roughly half of the city and by 1980 it would have been more and you can see where Crary St. Mary's is compared to the original areas of black population settlement. So this, this is fairly typical. Here are some of the typical black middle neighborhoods that emerged again during the same period in other cities, in Baltimore, St. Louis, Chicago, and one could go on. This was something that happened in virtually every American city. And it was extraordinarily important phenomenon. And to a large extent, these neighborhoods, once they were created, remained healthy, vital neighborhoods for quite some time. In fact, if we look at Crary St. Mary's, in terms of a whole variety of social and economic dynamics. From 1970 to 1980, virtually nothing changed except that the white families left and black families moved in. And the same was pretty much true up to 2000. The neighborhood remained an area with high home ownership, very low vacancy, low poverty, and high levels of couples raising children. So in other words, you're sort of almost archetypal middle class, middle neighborhood. Now, at the same time, nothing, things weren't perfect. There are a lot of stresses affecting these neighborhoods. Incarceration, the crack epidemic affected many neighborhoods during the 80s. Manufacturing jobs, which were the backbone for many black wage earners started to dry up in these cities. And of course, as a result of the overall municipal economic decline, you had deteriorating public services, you know, less maintenance, school declines, and a lot of other factors. So the neighborhoods were under a lot of stress 
but they hung in. They were solid neighborhoods for the most part. Well, something went wrong because after 2000, things really started to fall apart in, I would say, the majority of middle neighborhoods in older cities. And we see that in, in terms of a lot of social and economic and housing market indicators started to nosedive after 2000. And I'll, there were a whole series of things going on that sort of interacted with each other to, to lead to this. And I'll just, I'll mention them and then I'll drill down into a few of these because some of these are really important. The first, obviously, manufacturing jobs continued to erode in the cities. So for example, Baltimore lost half of the factory jobs it had left in 2000 by 2017. Chicago lost almost 40%. So that was one, but that was a continuing problem. That wasn't a new problem. The new problems were subprime lending, foreclosures, loss of home ownership, and as I'll explain, suburbanization. So what was going on? Okay, the first thing, I mean, we all know, and it's been thoroughly documented, that subprime lending focused on neighborhoods of color. And this map of, this is St. Louis, and you just look and you see, now St. Louis is a good place to show this because the historic racial dividing line is very clear. It goes along Del Mar Boulevard, which basically runs along here. So north of Del Mar, most of the loans were subprime. South of Del Mar, relatively few of them were. And if you look at the graph, you know, the higher the black population share, the greater the share of high cost or subprime loans. Well, that triggered, when the mortgage bubble burst, that triggered massive foreclosures and massive loss of homeowners, because as homeowners lost their homes, and these were both people who'd bought with subprime loans, as well as existing homeowners who'd refinanced with what were called cash out refinancing which they were tempted to do by a lot of people promoting those products. They lost their homes. The homes went into the bank's inventory. When they came out, if they came out, they were owned by investors. The one thing you see is you look at all of these cities and neighborhood, middle neighborhoods generally lost homeowners, but black middle neighborhoods lost them more. In Detroit, one out of every three homeowners in middle, a middle neighborhood in 2000 was gone by 2018. In Chicago, it's, it was one out of five. So, and the other thing that went along with this, house values, which had been propped up during the early OOs, plummeted, and for reasons we'll get into, have stayed down. And that's a critical problem. So what I looked at in one of my research projects, I compared two neighborhoods where the value of homeowner equity was basically the same in 2000. One, Baden, Walnut Park West, which is in the northern part of the city, is I think 98% black. The other, Shaw, is a mixed neighborhood. It's about one third black. And it's def definitely one of St. Louis's gentrifying neighborhoods. By 2017, 2016, sorry, from 2008 to 2016, homeowners in one single census tract in a black middle neighborhood lost $35 million in home equity. During the same period, the homeowners who lived in Shaw, again, one third of whom were black, two thirds predominantly non-Latinx white, gained almost 50 million in homeowner equity. So 
there's been a huge loss of home ownership and loss of wealth in these neighborhoods. Now, the other thing that goes along with this and is a big part of it, and I don't think some people who are working on the ground, I think, see this, but a lot of people don't. What's very interesting is that there's been an exodus of black middle class families from almost every older city in the United States. And this show, and the interesting thing about that is at the same time, there's been a tremendous influx in well-to-do, predominantly young, single couples, white people moving into these cities. So if you look at Baltimore, you can just see a direct relationship between income and the likelihood of leaving the city. The same is true in Chicago as well. The upper, upper middle income African-American families are leaving the cities in large numbers. And this is obviously another factor that is destabilizing middle neighborhoods. Because, and what's happening, when we, what I did is I compared where black home buyers were buying in 0406 compared to 2014, 2016. And what I found was stunning. I mean, the, in the later, more recently, far more buyers are buying in suburbs rather than in central cities compared to the earlier period. Now, it varies a lot from one city to the next. Detroit, which is probably the most extreme case, prior to the housing bubble bursting, for many years, roughly half of all black families who bought anywhere in the metro area bought in the city of Detroit. Since then, only 10% of black families buying in the Detroit area have bought in the city. In fact, for six years running, from I think 2009 to 2015, more black home buyers bought in the suburb of Southfield, which has a population of 10% of the city of Detroit, than bought in Detroit. And the, again, in Chicago, the disparity isn't as great, but every city I've looked at, more black home buyers are buying in the suburbs today compared to in the past. And the second thing, which goes along with this is among those black home buyers who are buying in the, sub, the central city, a percentage of them are buying in racially mixed rather than predominantly black neighborhoods. So for example, in St. Louis, which is a pretty extreme example of this, in 2005, over half of all black home buyers who bought in St. Louis bought homes in predominantly black neighborhoods. In 2018, less than a quarter did. So there was a tremendous shift in the patterns of home buying. And what this is, this has meant that black middle neighborhoods are basically suffering from inadequate housing demand. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit, because basically, you know that, we all know, a certain number of houses in a neighborhood turn over every year. I mean, people pass, people move away, people change their life cycles and everything else. And it's pretty, there's a pretty good rule of thumb that that number tends to average about 7% of the single family houses in a given year. And the range tends to rarely be more than nine, rarely less than five. So what you basically need, if you're gonna have a healthy neighborhood with a healthy housing market, you need to have enough home buyers each year to replace the people who are leaving. 
And that in round numbers means that the number of new home buyers in a neighborhood has to be equal to at least 5% and preferably somewhat more than that of the number of existing single family houses or the number of existing homeowners. Either way, you need to have that steady flow of home buyers. If not, what happens? The first thing that happens is investors start replacing homeowners. But investors typically only buy two types of houses that meet two conditions. One is that they have to be pretty inexpensive. And the second is that they don't need much in the way of repairs. Now, once the investors have kind of cherry picked that, there are often a lot of properties left, which means they are likely to stay vacant. And what happens is you start to get a vicious cycle where weak demand keeps property values down, increases vacancies, increases abandonment, reduces property values, increases poverty, reduces property maintenance, and ultimately the cycle means that remaining, you know, as it gets worse, you get proportionally fewer homeowners and home buyers, and more and more of the families that can move out decide that they will move out. So this is a very dangerous cycle, and it's one that may be going on in a lot of these neighborhoods. And I think the crux of the issue is to figure out how to reverse this cycle, how to rebuild demand. Now, that's not obviously a simple question. But first, just by way of description, as you recall, Crary St. Mary's was basically very stable from 1970 to 2000. Since then, this neighborhood has become significantly destabilized. And when you look at the numbers, you can see this. Home ownership has plummeted. Poverty, this went from a low to a high poverty neighborhood, a low vacancy to a high vacancy neighborhood. And what you see is that the number of couples raising children dropped by two thirds. So this neighborhood is now, um, it's not beyond repair, I believe, but it has gone through a major series of shocks. And again, all because of all the different factors that I've talked about. So why is there low demand in these neighborhoods? And again, a lot of this circular. If people see that property values haven't gone up for, in some cases, 10 years or more since the effect of the bubble bursting, they're not gonna expect much in the way of wealth building or equity. A lot of neighborhoods, would-be home buyers have trouble getting capital. In fact, it's well known that if you have a, you're trying to get a mortgage of 50 or 60,000, you're gonna have a much harder time of it, no matter what your credit is, than getting a mortgage of say 260,000, because the banks just don't consider those small mortgages profitable. A lot of the housing stock looks good, but it may be obsolete, it may require major work, it may have only one bathroom, which is a no-no for most home buyers nowadays. A lot of these neighborhoods either are or are perceived as unsafe. Again, it's all relative to what the options are, which are primarily suburban. The same is true of school quality. Reality or perception, it affects how people decide. And then finally, another thing that's critically important is that for a lot of reasons, and we know a lot of what they are, Non-black home buyers are extremely reluctant to buy in black middle neighborhoods. And in fact, there's been some amazing research was done recently by a psychologist out in California who found by 
what she did was show white subjects pictures of neighborhoods, but some where the people in the pictures were white and some where the people in the pictures were black. And what she found is that if the people in the pictures were black, the respondents rated those neighborhoods as less desirable than if the people in the pictures were white. And what she concluded that essentially black middle neighborhoods are invisible to white home buyers. So all of this tends to create weak demand for housing. And again, I believe that this is a central issue that has to be addressed in order to stabilize and revive these neighborhoods from the crisis so many of them are into. So to wrap up, I think three key points, maybe four. The first is that these neighborhoods matter. I don't think anybody should think of them as disposable. We sometimes have a tendency, we've been moving out of cities, we've been letting city neighborhoods go wherever they might for decades and decades. I think that's terrible. These neighborhoods have value, they have investment, they have meaning. We should be preserving them. The second point though, is that I think whatever else one is doing, the addressing low home buyer demand should be a central part of the strategy. And that of course requires a really close look at why in any particular neighborhood, the particular factors that are affecting demand and how to shift them. There's no magic bullet and there's no simple formula that can tell you what to do. You have to look closely at the dynamics, the strengths, the weaknesses, the challenges of each neighborhood and figure out a strategy that works there. But in the end, it can be done. It's a doable thing. So thank you. And now I think we'll turn to somebody who will show how it can be done. <laughs> well, we'll at least have Nidra tell us uh, a little bit about her um, experience of this neighborhood and her work. But do remember everyone that on the 25th, we're going to pivot much more deeply into strategies. So, um, I think we've handed controls over to Nidra. Thank you so much, Alan. That was outstanding. And we've had um, requests already for people to not only have a recording of this webinar, but also to have access to the slides so that they can study them more carefully. Um, so we're gonna try and make that happen as well. And I think there's a little lag time for when we switch screens. Um, so we'll see if Nidra's able to control her screen yet or not. And welcome Nidra and thank you so much for joining us. And just to remind everybody, Nidra is the Executive Director of the Greater Chatham Initiative in Chicago, where she's been working for many years and she's been a resident for more years. Um, and uh, this is on the south side of Chicago, as you can see in her map. Um, well, thank you, Marsha and um, Alan for um, for, for your presentation. It's really good to be here and a shout out from everyone in um, on from coast to coast it looks um, our 360 um, attendees um, Chicago it's a, a beautiful um, cool day um, here and as Marcia said I'm going to talk about the Greater Chatham Initiative which is a nonprofit that does economic development work in four communities um, on the south side. Let me know if you don't get control of your slides, um, Nidra. Not having control. <laughs> uh, I I can, oh, there you go. Okay, so um, so as Alan said, um, Chicago, Chicago has about 2.6 million people right now, but back in the day, it had about um, 3 million people and um, African Americans started coming to what's called the, the Black Belt, which you can see kind of the, um, the dark, um, predominantly non-white areas, um, the, the gray areas over on the right. Um, they came in the first wave um, 
in 1910-1930s um, as consistent with my um, grandparents and the second wave in 1940s, 90, 1960s, and that's consistent with my, um, with my parents. I am, um, next slide. Um, so, um, the, the Greater Chatham community comprises um, four communities that are adjacent. Um, it's Avalon Park, Arvin Gresham, Chatham, and Greater Grand Crossing. Um, started in um, 1836, um, was built up residentially mature by the 1920s, um, and um, is home to um, various gold medalists, like in 1899, we had uh, Major Taylor. Um, gospel music um, was founded here by Thomas Dorsey. Um, you can see Mahalia Jackson, um, who was a um, confidant of Martin Luther King, was there. Um, and Lorraine Hansberry, um, who um, was one of the first African Americans to um, have a play on Broadway was raised here and her father um, was one of the people who got the restricted covenants because not only could um, you were African Americans were um, confined to black areas, but legally you could not buy in those areas um, until those covenants lifted. Um, and then um, black people looking for other opportunities moved in and by 1960, um, the area is 63 percent black kind of um, next slide um, and then um, the 60s i would say in 70s were our golden years where we had several um four african-american um banks and savings and loans um insurance companies um a couple of companies on the new york stock exchange so those were our golden years um, um um, Johnson Publishing um, and um, Johnson Products. Um, it was well-known um, Fortune 500 companies. Um, Gary Comer from Lands Inn also came from the community. Um, and we had our first um, mayor, black mayor, um, Eugene Sawyer came. So those were our golden years from the 60s to the 90s. And then, um, as Alan said, there was a decline, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, but we still have our great cultural legacy. Um, so we have Chance the Rapper, Kanye West um, is from um, our community, um, and um, um, WBEZ reporter, um, Natalie Moore. So, um, so we have a very rich cultural, cultural legacy. Next slide. Okay, and so a little bit about my family history. Um, and so I grew up in this Georgia um, um, pretty much most of my life. My parents who were down at the bottom, um, my father who was a police officer, met my mom who was a divorcee with one kid um, and they um, got married. Um, and so unfortunately my dad was a police officer and he was killed in the line of duty. And my mother took those um, insurance proceeds and bought the house that she still lives in today um, and that um, and so I asked my mom how she was able to do that because um, it was not it was very difficult for African Americans to actually get a mortgage let alone a woman who didn't um, who had insurance um, um, income and not a real job and so the story is then Mayor Daly at my father's funeral said if there's anything that you can you need, please give me a call. And she called him and said, I need a mortgage. And so um, she got a mortgage, which I didn't realize until talking to my peers, which were very unusual, um, but she made it happen. Um, and you can see my larger family um, that has um, since um, lived and we, and we still live in Greater Chatham. Um, next slide. Okay, so why African American neighborhoods? This question drives me nuts because you would never say why white neighborhoods. Um, and so um, I love the, the legacy. I had an idyllic childhood growing up here. It's a way to preserve intergenerational wealth. 
um, and also our cultural, educational, and business assets. I mean, you can tell if people are from Greater Chatham because they have a particular kind of sensibility, and you can see that in the social cohesion, um, celebrate Black identity, and it was a safe haven against racism, which uh, when you leave your um, um, great nest and go out in the world, um, it's great to have a place to come back to. Next slide. So Greater Chatham, um, in 2019, it is 97% African American. Any place else, we would be a mid-sized city of 122,000 people, of which we have 47,000 households. Um, little skewed toward female, 56%. Um, we're pretty representative with the city of Chicago as far as birth to age 12. And then our folks disappear um, because there is, as I said, we were residentially mature. So we don't have any um, housing for uh, millennials or Gen um, Zs. Um, and so they go downtown and they come back when they're ready to buy a house um, in their 40s, in late 30s. Um, we are um, 50, um, 60 to 71 percent of our families have incomes of less than 50,000. Um, and as Alan said, we um, would like to recruit more families that have incomes over 75,000 because we are well represented with um, low and moderate income families. Um, conversely, side by side, in Greater Chatham, we have over 7,400 firms that generate annual sales of over $720 million. And those firms have 51,000 employees, of which 20% live here. Um, we're a little less than um, representative of, um, what is that, 27% of people have either associate degrees or graduate degrees, 30% um, have some college. Um, and then the rest. And then our, our unemployment rate um, had been going down, but because of COVID and the most recent recession, our unemployment rate jumped back up to 14 to 15%. Next slide. Okay, and so what I try to do is to let people know that Black communities are not monolithic. And in Greater Chatham, um, we have what I call a tell of two communities. Our homeowners are, um, are, are in much better shape. Um, 35 to 40% of our residents are homeowners. Um, our housing stock is very rich in two to four unit buildings and apartment buildings. Um, uh, our median income for our homeowners is 55.4, which is pretty consistent with the city of Chicago. Um, the national median net worth of um, Black African-American homeowners is about um, $99,000. And the average mortgage payment in Chicago is $1,200. Now compare that to our renters, um, which comprise the majority of our residents, um, 60 to 65%, where their annual income is $22,500. So more than half of their homeowners. And national median net worth of black renters is $1,800. So just think how slim that margin is. And the average rent in our neighborhood is $900. So look at it. You can rent an apartment for $900, or you can get a mortgage for $1,200. The biggest sticking point, as you can see, is that down payment. If you, if you only have $1,800, that's a hard nut to crack. Um, next slide. Um, and so, so, um, so I'm giving you... Um, in this map that was done by DePaul University, you can see that it's, it's color coded. And so people who make less than $20,000 by census tract is the very lightest color, um, kind of the peach. And the darkest are where you have incomes over um, $50,000. And so you can see even in our neighborhoods, our neighborhoods differ. And, and by and large, where you see the uh, more, um, wage working class um, folks, those follow our large swaths of where our two to four unit buildings are and where our apartment buildings are. Next slide. And so, um, so what we do is to get a better understanding of what's going on in our neighborhood, we actually track every year what the cells are. 
And so most recently we have sales from 2019 and um, the dots represent single family house sales and they're color coded and, and the meanings are, um, we try to see if there's an overall pattern and, and the white dots mean that there's no rhyme or reason. So you can have uh, uh, two bungalows side by side that are identical and one can sell for uh, you know, $190,000 and the other one can sell for $75,000. Um, but where there's a, a, a pop of color, that means that there is enough information, so that's a trend. And so you can see in the red and orange dots that those are home sales, um, the hot is over 170,000 is the median, and then 157 are the oranges. And then the blue spots also are, is significant because that's where you see investors go in, they buy the properties, they fix them up, they make them HGTV worthy so that millennials will buy them. And those cold spots are between where properties are selling between 50,000 and 38,000. So even in one community, there's a vast range of difference where our median single family sales price is 99,000. Next slide. Um, and so we've worked really hard to make um, the community stand out because in the city of Chicago, there are 77 neighborhoods that people can buy in and we have to promote the neighborhood through housing tours and, and, and other events to make us stand out. Next slide. And we do that through um, trolley tours and other mechanisms. And so we did an analysis to see where homeowners were coming from. And so one of the things that you can see, people, if they live in the neighborhood and they liked it, they bought in the neighborhood. Um, and so 55% um, of all new homeowners came from um, Greater Chatham or they came from adjacent Southside communities. Um, and then a portion came from um, the southwest side and the west side, you can see in the pink, and then um, some came from the near loop suburbs and south suburbs. So that, so yes, are we losing more population than we would prefer? Absolutely. Are people coming back in? Yes. Do they appreciate that we're close to the central city, that it's affordable? And what we're seeing is people coming in because they want a different, um, that, that they're resetting their lives, that they're empty nesters or they're um, buying a house with their mom and they want that two flat. And so what's driving it is being able to right size their housing to um, their family situation and doing it in an affordable manner. And those are the people that are showing up in as buyers in our community. Next slide. Um, and so what I also want to say is that, um, you know, we're always going to be below the city average as far as single family home price changes are, you know, freight Let's face it, most African American home buyers are black women, and black women get paid 72 cents on the dollar. So we're missing a third of our income off the bat. So we will never be consistent with our peers, um, but um, we do um, um, rate ourselves based on um, where other African American communities are, and that's who we um, try to um, stay ahead of the curve. We also um, talk about that we have great community schools because people assume that we don't, even though we do. And so we make that available in a form of school guides so people can make informed choices. Next slide. Um, and we also have a map where we can show people where they can workshop, um, eat and play in the community so that we do have amazing resources in the area so people can live here. And particularly with the COVID-19 um, lockdown, that became very important. Next slide. Um, and so now I'm gonna talk about our renter occupied um, housing. And you can see um, by the tracks that um, less than 40% is the light peach and more than 70% are is the burgundy, and that shows where um, rent burden households are. So our, obviously, if our average income for renters is 22.5, they are rent burden, and they, they are, they're, they're clustered. Um, 
And, and what you can see is we have found um, with the pandemic that people literally are hungry, um, particularly because we did have civil unrest. A lot of the grocery stores were taken out. And so we're doing a lot of food drives on the right with restaurateurs and others um, to, and food pantries to get food out. Next slide. Um, and because what we found through this COVID experience that um, we are home of essential workers. So whether they're at the top of the pay grade, there are police officers and firefighters and nurses and doctors who live in the neighborhood, or they are our grocery store workers. They live here. We had at one time, we were the epicenter for COVID-19 before we got in control. And um, what we saw is that um, consistent with the Kaiser Family Foundation, one in four essential workers are having trouble affording basic household expenses during the COVID crisis. Um, and so it led to um, civil unrest and renters in particularly are um, um, more challenged than, than their homeowners because they have less lease resources. Next slide. Um, and so, um, so this um, side on the rest shows kind of where renters are who are most vulnerable based on their housing occupation. And that um, kind of dark olive um, represents probably 70% of our geographic space. And so um, our families are experiencing duress and we're looking at how do we um, work with them. We're shifting some of our focus from home ownership to renters, and that's a work in progress. Over on the right shows um, how um, people came to our neighborhood to express their solidarity with us after the civil unrest. Um, to, to And so it was really just great to have people from all over the city come and um, kind of march with us on what next steps are. Um, next slide. And so, um, so these are some of our strategic partners. Um, and so I want to um, thank um, NeighborWorks and uh, Middle Neighborhoods and National Community Stabilization Trust and others for their work. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Nidra. Um, I love how you incorporated your own family's history in these neighborhoods. Uh, um, please, everybody, um, write your questions into uh, hopefully the Q&A box, but I'll check the chat as well. Um, and we have a couple of already that I'll, I'll chunk in here. So one person asked, do you think public transit factors in if a city has a broader public transit option versus a city that may have light rail services? So I don't know, um, do I, either of you have a thought about like neither in your case is public, are public transit options available? Oh, well, uh, Chicago has um, really superior public um, um, transit. And in fact, our um, 79th Street um, is the, has the highest ridership, um, it's the 79th Street bus ride, bus line has the highest ridership of any bus line in the city. Um, we also have um, good transportation that zips you from down um, from our area to downtown in 20 minutes. And so, um, so I would say that what we have found is that there's been a small reversal of people who used to live in the suburbs that are coming back to the city because they can get downtown to the central business district um, on a much faster rate. So, um, so public transit is not a concern for um, us in Chicago. I, I would just add to that, looking more broadly, I think public, good public transit, particularly in a large city like Chicago, which has a huge concentration of jobs in the center, as well as a very sophisticated transit network that links a lot of different places. Clearly, transit is a definite plus. In a lot of other cities, having a bus service or even rail service is not, it's always helpful. It's always better to have it than not to have it, but it's not 
a magic bullet. It's not something that's going to dramatically change the ground rules. There are a lot of places where, in fact, you know, people running transit lines have put transit stops in areas in need of revival in the hopes that it would make a difference. And usually, sometimes it does, but only when those areas have particular features. Usually it doesn't make that much difference. One thing to bear in mind is that at this point, especially in medium-sized and smaller cities, most people who live in the city, and I'd say even more so people who live in black middle neighborhoods, don't necessarily work in the city. They work in the suburbs or they work all over the place. So having transit, now again, big cities like Chicago, New York, it's different. But in the smaller cities, transit tends not to be as central because people's jobs are much more dispersed. But it's still better to have it than not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, someone pointed out that on our slide, we said the next webinar is on the 29th, when in fact it's on the 25th. So apologies for that. <laughs> um, we have another question. Um, there was a recent report on redlining in Chicago neighborhoods. Is that an issue in Chatham? Um, redlining is always an issue. Um, one of the things that I, I would say is um, the Metropolitan Planning Commission did a great study on um, Chicago in general and the effects of, of racism. And one of the things that they found is that investment follows white people. Um, it was not a revelation to black people, um, but it was a revelation to have that be documented. And so um, the redlining is, is a serious concern because in order for us to be truly um, um, tr truly competitive, you have to have an appraised value where you can buy something, you can fix it up, um, and you can sell it without um, taking advantage of families and, um, and, and extracting generational wealth from them so that an investor can um, buy low from them um, and make their profit margin, but you can't sell it at a competitive rate. And so that's unfortunately what happens because, um, so for example, and this is a little technical, that um, I would say that the average um, house in Chatham has, can, if you buy it, purchase and rehab it, that the after improved value is between, let's say, 100, let's say 125, 000, $125 a square foot, which is not quite replacement cost. You need probably a valuation of $150, $160 a square foot in order to um, have true replacement cost. On the south, on the north side where the white people live, um, their, um, their um, appraised value is about $300 to $400 a square foot. And so you can buy something there, you can rehab it, the, you know, the lenders are happy to lend you the money there, um, but you don't get that in, in, in Chatham. And so that's this feeling that there's an artificial ceiling, which there is, um, because you just can't get the values unless you live in a neighborhood where there's a large majority of white people. And that's High Park. If you look at where the highest values are on the south side of Chicago, they all are in sub-neighborhoods. That's High Park, that's Bronzeville, that's Bridgeport, where there's a large majority of white people. So if we don't address the structural racism, we will never get at it. Good. That's really interesting. And I, and I think one of the things that I, I see as a theme in Nidra's presentation is um, that she makes it a point to know the data and you can't address these problems until you understand these problems and you can actually show people what the numbers are. And I really have always admired that about Nidra's, um, the way she approaches the work. She's very data driven and you just heard her reel off all of these stats. She knows what the real estate market is doing all the time. Um, a related question to this, um, Nidra, is are lending institutions located within the greater Chatham neighborhoods and what are their lending practices when it pertains to mortgages? 
So our lending institutions, they are here, the big banks are here, um, but they basically take deposits, but they don't make mortgages. Um, so um, our number one lenders are those lenders that are online, Rocket Mortgage, um, so and, and others. And so the lenders are happy to take the deposits, but they don't make the mortgages in the community. Yeah, okay. Um, Here's a question. I'm going to uh, sort of merge together two questions. One of them is about how do you make sure that as you're um, building home ownership in the neighborhood that it's not, uh, you know, dislodging uh, lower income African American families who live there now. But the other one that I think is related to that is if most black home buyers are buying in the suburbs. Um, don't many black middle neighborhoods need to be able to attract non-black buyers? And I'm very curious, Nidra, how you um, deal with those two issues. So, so this is what I would, would say. I think that, um, so one of the things that I always um, um, chuckle about when people talk about black neighborhoods. Well, black neighborhoods were white neighborhoods where black people moved in. And when the neighborhoods hit a 33% tipping point, um, where it becomes more than 33% um, non-white, white people leave. And so you see this pattern of resegregation again and again and again. And the, and the few places where I've seen white people move back in is where the average home price is over half a million dollars by Carlo. Um, and so, um, so, 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 and, and Bronzeville here in, in Chicago. So that there's got to be a, a really great assets, logistical assets close to the central business district, beautiful housing stock, um, where you have um, um, folks coming in. In Chicago, where we see white people are much more comfortable moving into Hispanic neighborhoods, and those are the neighborhoods that are hot and experiencing a great deal of gentrification. Um, so we, we only have a couple of neighborhoods, black neighborhoods that are experiencing the uh, a significant amount of gentrification. And those tend to be um, black, higher income black people moving back into um, middle neighborhoods that were also still, that were um, um, African um, American. So I would say that it is not quite a problem. It's only in a, a, in a couple of Black neighborhoods where you see that level of gentrification. It's really our Hispanic um, brothers and sisters that are having such a hard time holding on to their communities because they are hot. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to pick up on that. I think it's really important not that people should ignore the possibility of gentrification. But we have to realize in city after city, the number of black neighborhoods, including black middle neighborhoods that are showing signs of weak market conditions, stagnant or declining house prices, low demand and so forth is much, 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 much greater than the number of black neighborhoods that are showing any signs of gentrification. And if we become too focused on the fear of gentrification, we lose track of the fact that far more neighborhoods need to have their markets built up rather than kept from going berserk. And so I think that's something we have to really appreciate. And in terms of how buyers, I mean, obviously, the government or CDCs or anybody else can't tell a home owner or an investor who to sell to. But so I think the main way you encourage to getting home buyers as distinct from investors is to make the area more attractive to home buyers, offer incentives, make sure they have access to capital, all of these kinds of things. The second thing though, is if you are going to get investors and any neighborhood is bound to get a certain number of investors is to make sure that you have the right kind of systems, whether it's code enforcement, whether it's neighborhood pressure or what have you, that when an investor buys a house in a neighborhood, 
that investor is put on notice from day one that they are, they are expected to maintain that property and be a responsible property owner. And that if not, they will be cracked down on because, you know, an awful lot of irresponsible investor behavior takes place because nobody is working to keep it from taking place. So I think the two things you've got to encourage more home buyers through all kinds of means, and you've got to make sure to investors and really send the message, you know, a responsible investor who maintains their property is an asset to our community. An irresponsible one who does not is a doing harm to our community. And we are going to make sure that we can tell the difference and deal with the ones who are not willing to be responsible owners. Okay. Um, we have uh, lots of additional questions. We're going to take a couple of more and just FYI, I will let people know what, you know, again, just revisit our upcoming webinar slide. But then I think because there is some such interest, we'll stay around and answer some additional questions if Alan and Nidra are both able to um, longer than our planned end time. Sure. So um, I here's a great question. Um, Nidra, how would you assess the retail commercial scene in Greater Chatham? Is that an amenity or an impediment to drawing in new households? Because I know she has a great answer for this. Um, so we have, um, we, 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 well, the reason why I'm having um, hesitation is that um, we had civil unrest um, the end of May, beginning of June. And so previous to that, we were kind of the breadbasket of the South Side. This is, Greater Chatham was where you went. We had big box stores like Walmart and Home Depot and Lowe's, um, mini grocery stores, um, um, retailers, um, Walmart. Um, and so um, for people on the South Side, besides downtown, Greater Chatham is where they came to shop. Um, we had um, really just horrific looting um, earlier that really hit the big box stores hard. Um, some of the Ma and Pa um, um, establishments as well. And so we're just really getting a handle on where we are. Do we still have some great assets? Absolutely. Um, what we heard, um, yes, we've become you know, kind of overnight is, again, when I talk about the tale of two cities, the renters, um, we became, uh, you, you, you know, they, they took out, um, you know, 40 ATMs, they took out the banks, they took out the pharmacies, they took out the grocers, um, um, so that you now um, have to be maybe one or two bus rides away um, to, to, to bank, to go to the pharmacist, to um, go to the, to, to the grocer. Um, so um, so it, it, it has become challenging. Our hope is that many of those establishments will rebuild and come back. But in the interim, um, yes, we have assets, but it is the hardest for um, folks who don't have cars um, to assess them. Um, let's see, uh, a lot of these questions have, uh, been answered. We, some of them will be great for next time when we're really focusing on strategies. Um, there are, let's see, I'm scrolling down. Are there any innovative programs addressing the value gap in Chicago? Um, and this person says in Tennessee, they have an appraisal gap program for nonprofit developers. Um, Nidra, I, uh, I wonder if you might mention how you interact with potential investors and what you're trying to get them to do in Greater Chatham. Sure. Um, so, so yes, there are appraisal gap um, 
um, programs that basically provide um, down payment assistance, and it can range from a couple of thousand dollars to um, twenty to twenty to thirty thousand dollars, depending upon the program. So, um, so that is the most direct way that deals with the appraisal gap as far as um, putting money in the hands of borrowers, but it doesn't address kind of the systemic devaluation of Black property. Um, there's been some programs that have been very good for white communities that um, um, address the, um, the, the gap in appraisal, and it's a state program, and it's I'm not coming to mind. And so, but those are the two systematic ways. Um, and, and the appraisal gap issue is really very important because you, for families that have choice, those black families um, that make over $75,000, they don't want their equity to disappear. And so they need to be assured that um, if they buy in a black neighborhood, that their equity is going to be there. Um, so that's something that we're thinking long and hard. Um, one of the ways that we deal with investors is that we give them the same data that you saw. We give it to the investors that are buying properties, fixing them up, and then selling them. The information is really important so that they can right-size their strategy so that they put in enough so that um, it's appealing and it meets code. Um, and they know that they have a market to sell it. And so we work with investors. Um, the reason why we have outpaced some of our other um, com um, neighborhoods is because we um, get that information and we cultivate the small investors in our communities so that they can um, um, make, 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 um, be, in, be that informed investor. Yeah, so she's actually encouraging investors to, um, you know, inspiring them, trying to give them more confidence to invest at a higher level because she's trying to build values. A lot of the questions that are in the chat and in the Q&A um, are about this ongoing tension between how do you improve a neighborhood without gentrifying the neighborhood? And, you know... And I'm going to jump in here because one of the things that I, I think people lose sight of, um, I just lost a neighbor who bought right before the last recession and their housing value never came back. And so it's really hard to have families in your community that are still upside down, you know, to what is it, 10 years past the recession? And so they've just had it. And so I always, you know, so we've gone from a modest you know, um, it's median income, I think five years ago was 67,000 and now it's 99,000. We're glad, we're great to see that, but we need to, to we haven't reached post, we haven't reached the recession highs from 10 years ago. And I just want to remind people that Yes, it be, can be more challenging, but we have the naturally affordable housing in our neighborhood, and that if I can get people who are still upside down to write to 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 actually in a place where they have equity, when people have equity in their homes, they feel good about live, living here. So that we are far from we have modest housing growth. Um, but we're far from the gentrification that you see that's fueled by our first rung neighborhoods right outside of downtown. So in our area, it's missing apples and oranges. You just, it, except maybe in Woodlawn where the Obama Library has yet to break ground and has been fueling a lot of investment. Um, it's just not an issue on the south side. I'd like to I'd like to second that sort of broaden the thing. I think some people have an impression that gentrification is some kind of an inevitable, overwhelming force that ultimately, if not somehow checked, will absorb all neighborhoods. That's not the case. Gentrification is one of many forms of neighborhood change. And in fact, if you look at the last 20 years, where there's been probably more gentrification than at any period before it, 
there's also been much more neighborhood decline in cities like Chicago or Cleveland or Detroit or Buffalo or any of these cities than there has been gentrification. For every neighborhood that's gentrified, maybe half anything from four to 10, depending on the city, have actually declined. And you know, it's not an inevitable force and it's not overwhelming. And I think to me, it ha it's really critical. You look at neighborhoods like the Greater Chatham neighborhoods, for example, and you know, people are seeing their house values stagnant. People who bought, say, 10, 15 years ago have never regained the wealth they lost when the mortgage bubble burst. People are losing houses still. Investors are still outstripping home buyers in terms of the number of buyers. Houses are still becoming vacant. And all of these things need to be tackled if you're going to create healthy, decent, sustainable neighborhoods. And I just get really concerned that when people somehow get so concerned about gentrification that they start to think that maybe they shouldn't be trying to improve their neighborhoods because it might trigger gentrification. I think that's very counterproductive. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, a big challenge. It, certainly as big of a challenge as gen, actual gentrification is in this country right now, I think Fear. We, we also have a challenge of trying to quell the panic and be thoughtful and data driven about it. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, if I could just add there, I think we have to recognize that when people think about gentrification, it's not just about the you know, change of the more affluent people moving into neighborhoods or house prices going up, but it's very much associated with feeling people feeling powerless that's right. in their community and people feeling that other people mostly, and in this case, this is very racially powerful, that other people, mainly white people, people with money and so forth, are making decisions about their community and about the city that they have no say in. Agreed. And I think that's, that's a, an undercurrent to this, and that's very real, and I wouldn't minimize it for a second, but I think, again, we have to look at these neighborhoods in perspective. And I think we have to look at each neighborhood individually and work with neighbors to, you know, figure out what are the real threats to this neighborhood and what are the, you know, the, all of the risks at play, including having people leave the neighborhood because values are so low that they can't make required improvements and maintenance to their homes because of appraisal gaps. There are a lot of factors that have to be balanced in each neighborhood. And that is where the expertise of someone like Nidra comes in to work with neighbors to evaluate all those pluses and minuses um, and try to navigate a strategy that mitigates the worst of the potential downsides to improvement while um, maximizing the upsides to uh, it. I could just second that. I think all of this points out how incredibly important it is if you're working in a particular neighborhood or group of neighborhoods in a particular city is to really understand in as much depth as possible what is going on socially, economically, demographically, housing market-wise and so forth in the city as a whole and in your particular neighborhood. So you can really figure out what is likely to be effective and what is not. As distinct from sort of, you don't wanna go say, hey, Nieder's got a great program, I'll just do that in my neighborhood or anything else. You really have to know your neighborhood and your city as a whole, because you know what happens in a neighborhood is in a large part a function of what's happening in the city, what's happening in the region, are people moving out, people moving in, are jobs growing, and so forth. So you really have to understand that stuff. Yeah. So um, just to uh, point out, I want to mention that our webinar in September will be about community engagement strategies during COVID-19. So how do you engage with neighbors 
when you can't meet in person. And then I just want um, Anne to move us to the next slide and leave that up while we continue to answer questions for those who want to stick around. Just so you know, this is our website. Um, it all got kicked off with a, a book, that book on the left, On the Edge, America's Middle Neighborhoods, which has, um, it's every chapter is written by a different person. I wrote one, Alan wrote two, I think. Um, and you can read it for free at the uh, Federal Reserve of San Francisco's website, or you can buy the book on Amazon. We have, um, of course, our website. We also have a newsletter and we encourage everyone on this call to go to the website and consider signing up at the bottom of any web page to at minimum start getting our newsletter. And if you are someone who wants to be a little more in depth to join our community of practice, you also have that option at the same time. Um, okay, so back to the, the questions that we didn't cover. Um, here's somebody that, this is something, well, this is interesting. Alan, what makes a neighborhood black or white? The neighborhood I live in was 100% white in 1960, 70% in 1970, 50% white in 1980, and it's 30% white today. Does that mean it's now a black neighborhood or is it an integrated neighborhood? We formed a community association in 1965 with the purpose of creating a conscious multiracial community. Uh, we had to challenge realtors who were engaging in blockbusting, um, even got a cease and desist order from the state AG's office. Uh, for the most part, this has maintained a situation where whites and blacks become homeowners at a similar rate uh, the conversion of many homes to rental, however, has increased the renter population more rapidly. Many of the renters happen to be black. The non-black renters happen to be, tend to be college students. Yeah. So, there, there's no magic number, you know, it's, and you know, I, it, it'd be great if you could say a neighborhood becomes a black neighborhood when it, its black population exceeds 68.32% or something like that. But no, the problem is, and to refer to actually in many respects, especially nowadays, to refer to white neighborhoods or black neighborhoods is often quite misleading because they're predominantly one or the other, but there, there aren't, for example, outside of some maybe some very affluent places, there are very few neighborhoods that don't have some black population. And for example, in many, many parts of these cities, you have neighborhoods that are 20, 30, 40, 50% African American and fairly stable in those, those levels. So I think a lot of it is, a lot of this is about perception and it's about attitudes. I think one thing that's interesting, when you look at the patterns of white home buyers, there tend to, obviously, most white home buyers buy in neighborhoods that are predominantly white. But there are significant numbers of white home buyers who buy in neighborhoods that have what one might consider relatively high percentages of black people, 40, 50, 60 percent and so forth. But it seems to the break point today, I wouldn't say is around 30 or 40 percent. I think it's quite a bit higher. But there is a break point at which point non-black buyers start to perceive a neighborhood as being quote unquote a black neighborhood and then start perceiving it differently. And I would say depending on the city, depending on the housing type, depending on lots of things, that break point could be anywhere between 60 and 80 percent. This, But you can't come up with a number, but there's no question in my mind that for most prospective buyers, for people who look at a neighborhood, there is, there is somewhere in there, there are break points. Yeah, and I, and I think that's another thing that you would want to track for every neighborhood you're working in. Like, I, I'm always very interested to track sales for the previous year in terms of what percentage were owner-occupied versus rental. And I suppose with Humda data, although it would be a little more dated, you could also understand the race of yeah. at least right of home buyers in yeah. previous years. you could start to see whether that was changing in what ways it was changing yeah. i'd say humda data can be very helpful in helping understand your home buyer market admittedly it's not going to be last week's data i think the most recent data is 2018 
but it can really give you a picture of the race, the gender, the income level of the people who are buying in a particular neighborhood broken down by census tract. And you can get some, and that can give you some real insights in terms of who the markets are, whether the buyers are women, men, and so forth, and whether the buyers are people who are more affluent than the current average in the neighborhood or less so. So it doesn't tell you much about the investors because investors typically, for the most part, don't get mortgages, at least not mortgages from Humda reporting entities. But it tells you quite a lot about home buyers. You have to look at assessor's data for that probably. Yeah, Just and they're not gonna give you demographics. Right, but they, so there's a couple of places you'd need to look to assemble, to be able to track as closely as possible how sales each year are trending in terms of who's buying what. Yeah. Um, One thing, by the way, which is an interesting source if you can get it, is multiple list reports. So I'm currently working with, I've been able to get a multiple list data dump for Baltimore from the beginning of 2019 to basically a week ago. Because one thing I'm particularly interested in doing is trying to see how the COVID pandemic has affected house sales. And one of the things it has, for example, it indicates whether the buyer has a mortgage, and if so, whether it's conventional, FHA, VA, and so forth. And from that, you can get a very clear sense of the relative weight of home buyer versus investor purchasers in a neighborhood. Great. Uh, also, Alan um, mentioned in to one of the questions in the chat about how to get some of the same data that he presented on some cities for their own cities that he's written a guide, um, which is always available at Center for Community Progress. What's that guide called, it's Alan? Called neighbors, neighborhoods by Numbers. And it's like how to do, you know, what sources of data will tell you what and how to access them and pull that stuff together. And we're gonna to talk to Community Progress and see if we can also post that along with this website at, at with this webinar at our website. Um, let's see, uh, kind of related to that previous question, Alan, Kamala Lewis, who is gonna be one of our presenters at the next webinar, asks, um, do you know if when black home buyers buy in the suburbs, we're ending up with more racially diverse suburban neighborhoods, or are we continuing the pattern of creating black neighborhoods within suburban cities? That's a good question. I've got to admit right off the bat, I don't really have a solid answer to that question, but I really should take a look and see what I can find. But just an impression looking at a few different metros that the answer is some of both. And I think where you see the break point is because clearly the black families moving to the suburbs are like anybody else, quite diverse economically. And I think by and large, the neighborhoods where the lower income, not poor, but because they're obviously, you know, at a level where they can at least buy a house, are moving, are more likely to start to become black neighborhoods or black suburbs even, as you see in South Cook County. And the more affluent black suburban buyers tend to be moving into neighborhoods that tend to stay more racially diverse. But that's just an impression and I don't really have a lot of good data yet. Okay. Uh, I, uh, somebody uh, made the statement, which I completely agree with, that concern over gentrification in many cases in legacy cities primarily is symptomatic of today's great economic inequality. Um, I, yeah, in my own personal work, um, I am always, whenever someone talks about gentrification and I see that house prices, housing values are pretty low, one of the things I want to look at data-wise is if you control for inflation, how have wages changed from 1970 to now? 
how have house prices changed and how have rents changed? And I find often that the problem is not that housing has become more expensive, it's that wages have stagnated and people in turn have lost, um, lost wages against inflation, which is a different problem uh, than housing cost inflation. Right. And frankly, I think it's, a, it's something that every one of us who are in the housing business are gonna have to start talking about more and more, educating people about, and we're probably gonna have to start getting into the business of advocating for you know, higher minimum wages, more you know, fighting this growing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the thing I would, I would argue for, especially for low-income renters, a change to whether you call it a voucher or a housing allowance or what, so that that becomes an entitlement like SNAP yeah. rather than a lottery where only one in four or one in five eligible families can get the assistance they need so they're not spending 50, 60, 70% of their income for rent. Yeah. And I just want to highlight again what that great point that Nidra made earlier that um, African American women earn 70% of their what. Uh, well, actually, I don't know if you meant against white men or white women, but in any case, it's it's even a, a greater exas uh, exasperation of this di the growing income divide mm -hmm. that faces these neighborhoods. Um, we have a question that I'm going to try and kick to the next webinar. What role can land banks play in supporting black middle neighborhoods? Off the top of my head, it, you know, it can be nice to um, any any tool, I think, where you can control some of what's happening um, and intervene in, especially if there's a rapidly, you know, if there's a neighborhood where you have a lot of investor purchases and you can stop that cycle for a moment, pause it, and do some of the strategies like Detroit's land bank has been doing around trying to reposition those homes for home buyer purchase. Absolutely. We'll talk more about that later. Yeah. Um, Alan, what about um, just the whole idea that these legacy cities have lost population in general and the extent to which that is, is a challenge for black middle neighborhoods as well as um, every other middle neighborhood? It's a, it's a huge challenge and <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly how to fix it because a lot of these cities are still losing population. And to the extent, if you look at Baltimore, for example, Baltimore is still losing black population at a very rapid rate. It's gaining white population, but the gains are going into a very small part of the city, mostly a few neighborhoods around downtown the Inner Harbor, and Johns Hopkins University. So most of the city is still losing population. And if you are still losing population, there is no way that you can preserve every neighborhood as an intact neighborhood. And in fact, that's why we see in cities that have lost a lot of their population, we see many neighborhoods that have effectively been hollowed out over decade after decade of population loss. Now, black middle neighborhoods are kind of in the middle. These are not neighborhoods that have been hollowed out by population loss, but in many cases, they're neighborhoods that are at risk of being hollowed out if the population loss continues and they continue to lose population because a lot of black middle neighborhoods are losing population. And that ultimately works against maintaining the vitality of their housing stock because they end up having progressively more and more houses relative to the population. So yeah. it's, a, it's a huge problem. And unfortunately, I'm not sure that it's, you know, a, prop a problem that's easily solved. I think, you know, this may sound very harsh on my part, but I think in some cities, which are steadily losing population, somehow some neighborhoods may be able to find the formula to regain or maintain vitality. Other neighborhoods may not, if only because there just may not be enough housing demand to go around. 
Yeah. I, I, I cut my teeth in the community development industry in Peoria, Illinois, um, after the major employer there, you know, laid off half its workforce that would have been in the early eighties. So, um, there were definitely not enough warm bodies to go around for all the houses that were there and there had to be a real adjustment to the size of the stock. So for Nidra, are there any young whites buying in Greater Chatham? That's certainly happening in some black neighborhoods in Detroit. So it looks like we lost Nidra. Yeah, I don't see her. <laughs> About a few minutes ago, yeah. So I'm not sure what happened there, but she- okay. um, yeah. She may have had to take off. Um, so I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I will just uh, address this other question for Nidra. Has Greater Chatham Initiative been in conversations with retailers whose stores were damaged during the protests? And I can tell you that she certainly has. She has a very robust um, sort of set of strategies around supporting businesses and growing businesses in her commercial district. And she has been doing a lot of outreach to businesses to um, help them uh, recover and even before the um, damage to their businesses to help them just deal with um, how to do business and stay alive uh, when, you know, so many, when there's been all of the lockdowns around that would affect customers. Um, Okay, so everybody, I'm going to let you all go now. I really want to thank our outstanding presenters. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for showing how important the Black Middle Neighborhoods are and how important it is for us to learn uh, what we can to effectively stabilize them and keep them to be that really important, unreplaceable part of the great American city. So we'll see you next time and keep an eye on our website, um, sign up for our newsletter, and that way you will always get direct communication about forthcoming webinars. Thanks, everybody.